Well, good morning, everybody. It is so great to have each and every, each and every one of you here today. Uh, those that are visiting, it's great to have you joining us. And those that call Asbury home and those that are watching online, it's great to have you with us today. A uh, couple quick announcements to start today off. Uh, Pastor Brent is on vacation. Thank you. <laughs> that's literally, that's all I got is one announcement. <laughs> So uh, what we're going to do right now, though, is uh, I want you to take a moment uh, to the pr people that are around you and just give them a greet, just give them a hello, and it's uh, so great to have you with us today. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, tomorrow is Canada Day. Is there anybody here who will be celebrating Canada Day for the first time? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, uh, good. One of the things I want you to be thinking about uh, is something that you're thankful for about living in Canada. We're going to look at that in a couple minutes. But right now, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we invite you to inhabit our praises and our worship today. Speak to us with words that challenge and comfort us, words that um, push us forward, help us take the next step. We welcome your presence and we pray for your blessing upon our service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome. If you are a believer and follower of Christ, you have many blessings to thank the Lord for. Psalms 103 declares, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always ch chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Psalms 103, 1, 5, 8 to 12. I'm going to ask that you stand with us this morning.
you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the Kids, you can come forward for a time of prayer with Pastor Jeff. Well, hey, great to see you all. Now, um, we have uh, uh-huh, we have some we have kids from Canada, we have kids from the U.S., uh, maybe even someone from Cameroon uh, here today. Hi, Haley. Hi, sweetie. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, as you go, uh, remember what a blessing it is to live in Canada, okay? And send, pray with me, send you in. Father in heaven, would you bless each child here? Bless them with health and protection and kindness in their lives. Watch over every step that they take and bless them with faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Off you go. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the root of Jesse and the rock of ages. He's the ancient of days, the commander of God's army and the radiance of God's glory. He is the holy one, the heir of all things, the bread of life and the author of life. He is the perfecter of faith, the overseer of souls, the horn of salvation, the desire of nations and the son of righteousness. He's the consolation of Israel, the Lion of Judah, and the Man of Sorrows. He is the gift of God, the Lamb of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the image of God, and the angel of God. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Son of Joseph, and the Son of Mary. He's the King of the Jews, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord of the Sabbath, and the Lord of Glory. He's the Morning Star, the Last Adam, the Living Stone. He is the true witness. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the good shepherd, the great high priest, the chief cornerstone, and the righteous servant. He is the highest, the almighty, the firstborn, the advocate, the head, the resurrection, the temple, and the sanctuary. He is the branch, the vine, the way, the truth, the life, the gate, the rock, the light, the prophet, the apostle, and the Nazarene. He is the carpenter. wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the Messiah, the Word, the Rabbi, the Teacher, the Master, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, Mediator, Creator, and Judge. He is Emmanuel. He is Yahweh, Lord, God, Savior, Christ. He is Jesus. Let's stand as we sing How Worthy the Lamb is.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. to the Lamb, honor and glory, worthy is he who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power, he is alive and the stone is rolled Father, we uh, begin our prayer time this morning confessing that in many ways we have not lived up to the call, your call in our lives. We have not lived uh, in, in a, in, with clarity and with joy. We Forgive us our sins this morning, Lord. You've said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this morning... Thank you for bearing our sins in your body on the cross. By your wounds, we are healed. By your blood, we are cleansed. Thank you for your forgiveness. And Father, this morning, uh, 
for the, for the ones at the altar this morning, may you meet them in their hour of need. If they're praying for themselves, Father, I pray that you would equip them, that you would um, furnish them with what they need to take the next step, that you would surround them with love and protection, uh, encourage their hearts with faith to move forward. And for all of us, we just take a moment now in, in the silence and lift our concerns up before your throne of grace. Thank you that your face is towards us, that you are close to the brokenhearted, that you hear our prayers, that you gather up our tears and our prayers, and they are a, a fragrant offering before your throne of grace. Father, encourage each of us to live lives that bring glory to you, lives that recognize that Jesus is the light of the world and that that, that light in us would be our, our way forward, a lamp before our, uh, on our path before our feet. Thank you for meeting with us this morning, Lord, and thank you for this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. scripture reading today is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1 through 25 and 35 to 38 from the NIV. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen seen him begging, asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him.
Uh, well, um, welcome again. Um, and I wanted to ask you a, a question because uh, some people came in after I asked the original, it's a, original question. Is there anybody here today who's celebrating Canada Day for the first time? <laughs> I know, I know my friend Charles is. So way to go. Let's have a hand for Charles. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's, what's, what are a couple of things that you're thankful for for, for, for living in, in Canada? What are some good things about Canada that you would like to say, I'm happy about? Pardon me? Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else over here? Peace. Okay. Yeah. Law and order. Okay. It's not perfect, but uh, as Telly Savalas once said in a crime drama, it beats what's in second place. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree. No, law and order is the pillar of our democracy. So, someone else. Hymns. Pardon me? Hymns. Hymns. Okay, beautiful. Tom always has something salient to say. Tom, uh, so uh, we're going to begin looking at this amazing passage that was read to us this morning. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, but we're going to touch on a few things today. It's full of drama and humor, uh, even, and, um, and lots of, like about six or seven scenes that you can almost see in a play. Uh, this, this guy, Jesus shows up at the beginning and shows up at the end, and in between there's all this little drama going on. It's, it's fascinating to see. Uh, so we're going to look at the Gospel of John. Just a few details about the Gospel of John. John's family name was Zebedee, um, and the Gospel of Mark mentions this in Mark 19, or 119. It says, when he had gone a little further, uh, Jesus saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So John was a fisherman, and he left his father's nets. And because of what he saw and heard in the next three years, he said, we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When John started out his journey, he did not know that. He came to understand that in those years he spent with Jesus. And when he wrote this account of the time that he spent with Jesus, he was advanced in age, probably the last of the disciples living, and John doesn't tell us just what happened. He tells us why it happened. In the Gospel of John, there are seven miracles that he builds his account around. He calls them signs because signs point to something. So he turned water into wine. He walked on water. He healed an official son. He fed the 5,000. He raised Lazarus from the grave. And um, he walked on water. And um, he healed a man at the pool of Bethesda, and he healed, as, as in our, our narrative today, he healed the man born blind. And signs point to something, and John tells us what they were pointing to. And in John 20, verse 30 and 31, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In other words, John would say, in those three years I spent with Jesus, I came to understand that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, and I have put my faith and my trust and my life into his hands. And I'm writing this, so that you also will come to understand who Jesus is and you also will place your faith and your trust and believe and have real and eternal life. And eternal life is not something that starts after you die. Eternal life 
is living this life knowing that there is something beyond this life. And John knew that, and he wants us to know that. So in this passage, the sixth healing miracle, or sign as John called it, it points towards something. What does it point towards? It points towards there is a blindness that is spiritual. And only Jesus, the light of the world, can bring awareness and enlightenment to this spiritual condition. And so the man who was born blind in this narrative doesn't just receive his sight, which is miraculous. He hears the words of Jesus and believes. His eyes are opened not just to the marvels of the physical world around him, but to the truth and grace and mercy that Jesus calls us all to receive. That's the heart of this passage. Now, along with that, there are some other compelling issues going on, and we're going to look, touch briefly on some of those today. I have uh, a couple of reasons why this passage spoke to me. Sharon recently had uh, some eye surgery, uh, for one thing, but recently uh, we also visited some friends of ours in Penticton. Uh, well, these are friends of 40 years, and uh, a man, a husband and wife, they're both blind. Some of you probably know them. They used to live in Smith's Falls. Um, and they are amazing, an amazing couple. Um, they are blind, but they are people of faith. They have entrusted their lives to, to God through Christ. They are blind physically, but spiritually, their eyes have been opened. They see with spiritual eyes of faith. And on our flight home, I was telling this to, to Paul, who, whose flight has been canceled. Good WestJet flight. Uh, there was a, an attendant on that flight, a stewardess. Stewardesses do not have a lot of time to talk to you. But I noticed this stewardess was wearing a cross pendant, and there was something written on it. So when she had a moment, I called her over. I said, what, do, what does that cross pendant say? And she said, it says, God loves you. Well, that's an open door for me, right? That's, a, that's an invitation for me. <laughs> so I said, what, what, what happened? Like, what's your story? And she said, she had hit rock bottom. And she had tried self-help books, um, talked to people. No one told her about faith in Christ, but she started to read her Bible. And she testified that God opened her eyes as she read. God showed her the way he opened her eyes. She became a woman of faith, and she would say that she was blind and that God had opened her eyes to the truth. So there is a blindness that is spiritual, and Jesus is the only one, the light of the world, who can bring awareness and enlightenment to this spiritual condition. Now, we have all been in that place at one point. And some of you have shared your journey towards faith here in front of us all, and it's been encouraging and enlightening to hear those stories. Now, I came to faith at the age of 24. My eyes were opened. <laughs> I took a step of faith towards Jesus, and it was the start of a journey that has lasted 50 years. I'm 54 years old, or 74 years old now. <laughs> and my name is Joe Biden, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that journey uh, of, of faith which began, began by taking that small step, okay, open the eyes of my heart, the journey of a thousand miles begins by taking a step of faith, a journey of a lifetime, a journey of eternal, of eternal life begins by taking that first step. Paul, uh, as you recall, 
who wrote several of the New Testament books, had his moment on the road to uh, Damascus when he saw light, heard the voice of Jesus, and he believed. And he wrote, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. That's what Paul wrote. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So in our passage today, it says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Now, apparently the disciples did not see this man. Um, but uh, there is another uh, story when you remember it, when a guy by the name of Bartimaeus, who was blind and was uh, begging, when he heard Jesus was around, he started yelling. And the disciples tried to sh quiet him down. Hey, quiet down. He, he yelled all the more, and Jesus said, bring him here. And he healed him. This guy was not yelling. Uh, the disciples didn't see him. In this case, it's Jesus who sees him, and his heart is drawn to, to, to this man. In other words, he's not invisible to Jesus. Okay. Sometimes we fail to see people. Domestic workers, cashiers, gas bar attendants, frail elderly people in long-term care. We've, we've, but we, when we do see them, What's our response? Okay. They have intrinsic value to God. They have intrinsic value as people, whether they're valued by society or not. And Jesus sees this man, it says, as he was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind, and the disciples asked him, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, the disciples ask a theological question. Right? Why was this guy born blind? Now, it's not the only time that this question arose. In Luke's Gospel, uh, Jesus refers to the Tower of Siloam falling on some people in Jerusalem, and 18 people lost their lives in that. And Jesus asked the question, do you think these Galileans, the ones who died, were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they had suffered this way? He says, no, no. Then he added, unless you repent, you too will perish. So the disciples ask a theological question, and why was the man born blind? And I think whenever there is sickness or tragedy or misfortune, that question comes up. Why? Why me? Why her? Why him? Why them? How do you answer the question, why, concerning pain, tragedy, and suffering in our lives? Now, that is a question that Books and books have been written about. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. Vanitha Risner, someone I've recently discovered, wrote a book called The Scars That Shape Me. Okay. So lots has been written, and I am not an expert on this, but I'm going to touch down lightly on it because I think it's an important question. And we see that how Jesus does answer the question. Jesus does answer the question. We're going to look at that in a moment. But, and there is a, an overarching theological response. That, but for most of us, this question is both deeply personal and deeply emotional. Why is it deeply personal? Because when you go through times of pain and suffering, you're forced to evaluate and reevaluate your life and consider 
your own frailty and your own mortality. It just happens. So three years ago when I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, was it my sin that caused me to become ill? That would be like the example of what these disciples are suggesting. Well, um, the answer uh, Jesus gives us is no, but let's just look at that a little bit. Because sometimes we think, have I sinned against God and am I reaping the results of that sin? Is it my bad behavior that has caused me to, to, to reap the, the benefits or the results of this uh, misbehavior? This is what the disciples believed okay? and what the Pharisees believed. They believed that misfortune and illness were the result of something you had done or hadn't done. And similarly, if your life was full of good things, this was a result of your good behavior. Now, there are some thorny sort of undertones with that thinking. One of them would be that if you think that your be it's your good behavior that has prospered you, and you take credit for it, you could say, that's sort of an entitlement kind of perspective, right? Look at everything I've accomplished. And conversely, if you think that uh, it's their bad behavior that has caused them to live the poor lives that they're living, it's, it's callous to think that because it's not true. Okay? We all know people who have suffered through no fault of their own. And others who have lived carelessly and prospered, maybe even at the expense of others. So the answer to the question, was it my sin that caused my illness? Right? The answer to the disciples, was it them or their parents that sinned? No. We cannot blame specific illness or misfortune on sp specific sin. Now that being said, okay, if you have been participating in sinful, self-destructive behavior and it catches up with you, well, that's a different story, right? We can all think of examples of that. But the overarching theological perspective that probably the disciples did not want to hear, and I guess would be, would be that we know that God created humanity with the choice to do good or evil, to do right or wrong. And Adam and Eve had that choice and they chose to rebel against God. And the, com the commitment of that first act of rebellion caused suffering and death and sin to curse the ground, Genesis says. And we live now in a creation that groans before God to bring restoration. So sin and death and suffering entered the world and we groan with creation under the weight of it. That would be kind of the underlying theological issue behind suffering and death, suffering and sickness. But I love the scripture that was read uh, this morning by Laura. I didn't choose that, but it, it, is, it is Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It goes on to say, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Okay. So he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. As you know, uh, Sharon and I lived and worked in Haiti for a number of years, and I've been following the tragedy and the chaos that's happening in Haiti. And one particular story caught my attention recently. There was a young American couple who 
were killed in the violence that's occurring there. Davy and Natalie Lloyd were doing missionary work with abandoned children in Port-au-Prince. And they got caught in the crossfire between two, two groups and were killed. And a friend of theirs, following their death, a friend of theirs, this would be last week, went with a small team back to Haiti and stepped into the work of caring for these abandoned children. And here's what he wrote. Some of the reason I went is probably selfish to maybe find more answers to the why question that has plagued me since that day. I did, in fact, find more answers to the why, but not in the way I thought I would. What I realized is God was using us, that is, he and his team, being there this soon as confirmation to the children that they were still loved by God and that he hadn't left them and that there is still hope some of the kids and even the adults had thought that it was over, that surely the missionaries would not return after that had happened. He said that the bottom line is that, the, that ultimately this was a battle between good and evil, and though it seemed like evil won, it didn't. I'm convinced of that more than ever, the witness of Davy and Natalie left behind will live on for future generations. And then he said, my faith will never be the same. My commitment will never be the same. My resolve to do whatever God calls me to do will never be the same, no matter what the cost might be. This has changed me in such a deep way, I can't really even express it in words, and I'm not the only one. It is deeply personal and deeply emotional. The, this friend's response to the tragedy and the question why was to go. He may never understand the why, but he has personally and publicly recommitted his life to serve the Lord and be the Lord's hands and feet to those children. Now, Jesus does answer the question when the disciples say, who sinned, this guy or his parents? Jesus says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work but while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. It's kind of a package. It's not just a simple answer. He said, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Jesus says this is an occasion for the glory of God to be revealed. It's an opportunity for God, God's works to be displayed the point is not that God caused these things. The point is that through these things, God's glory and work can be shown. And when we look at the cross, Jesus revealed that even evil can be ultimately overcome for the glory of God. The cross is the ultimate display of suffering and evil and the means by which God accomplished his purposes and displayed his glory. And so our suffering can be a time when God's glory and God's power is revealed in our lives. The Apostle Paul, in, uh, in his letter to the Corinthian church, wrote this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Jesus said it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. And then he said, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. We must carry out. He and the disciples. And I would say to you, that was the answer that that man found in Haiti. He, rather than find an answer to the question why, he became an answer to those abandoned children. Suffering can make you reevaluate your life. It is God's school. When I discovered I had an autoimmune disease, I sought the Lord with a renewed ardor and passion and emotion. In my suffering, I learned a few things by God's grace. I did not answer the question, why? I did ask my respirologist, why do I have this autoimmune disease? And he said, if I knew the answer to that, I would win the Nobel Prize. I did learn that I needed to press into the heart of Jesus. I did learn that I needed the fellowship and community of family and friends and faith. I did learn to count my blessings, however small. I did learn that Jesus carried me close to his heart and led me by springs of living water. God opened my eyes anew in my illness to his faithfulness and love and grace. Now, I started this message with the words from the Gospel of John that said that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And the man born blind in this narrative doesn't just receive a sight. He believes. He hears the words of Jesus and believes. His eyes are open not just to the marvels of the physical world around him, but to the grace and mercy and truth that Jesus calls us all to receive. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. And you may recall John Newton, who wrote the original version of this in the 1700s. John Newton had been the captain of a ship that was a slave trading ship. And when he found faith in Christ, he fought against this travesty for the remainder of his life. He said, I once was blind, but now I see. I'm going to ask that you stand with us. Was 
once was lost, but now I'm found. Friends, I hope you'll join us for some coffee and treats uh, following the service. And now, may the Lord open our eyes and you to this amazing world we live in, to be thankful. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Friends, go in peace and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.